welcome to Broyhill Chapel on the campus of Mars Hill University. We're delighted that all of you are here. We have a number of students and faculty and staff and retired faculty and staff and, and friends of the community and region. But I suspect in this space, other than our guest speaker, there are some here that this is the first time you have been in this space. So welcome, a big, big welcome to you. We're delighted to have trustees here. I see at least two, uh, Wayne Higgins and, and David Costner. There may be others. Um, if they are, I apologize for not being able to see you. Uh, a point in fact, uh, this is a special day, as I shared with the group at, at a dinner a moment ago, when we have our first presidential lecture and performance series event of an academic year. We began this uh, endeavor in 2013-14. As we transition from college to university status, we wanted to, to bring to the community, the campus and the broader community, an array of activities that we felt would be of additional service to the community and the campus. So in this process, we've had former governor of North Carolina, we've had the president's own band, army band, um, do a performance, and a lot of other things in that mix. So this is the first event of the 2017-18 academic year, and we are so delighted that you're here in this space with us. I will not uh, do the introduction of our guest speaker. We had a delightful time at dinner. We uh, shared uh, information. I picked her brain in terms of some uh, building and, and construction issues. And uh, uh, so that was very helpful. And in, especially in that the board chair was there to uh, take copious notes uh, mentally uh, for what will be coming in our future. But this is a special time. One of the reasons it's so special is that we will be blessed by the Mars Hill Gospel Choir. And uh, thank you young people for being here this evening to, to bless us with your music and your talent. We have been so fortunate to hear you on other occasions. Uh, Ms. Hackett, dare I make the announcement? May I make the announcement about these young people? Oh, okay. It is the presidential prerogative to announce with great pleasure. Pardon? Oh, really? Oh, should I not? Well, no, I don't. I am so pleased to share with the choir that, uh, and all of you present, that they have been chosen to be the keynote performers at the annual Martin Luther King Breakfast in Asheville this coming January. So there you are, there you are. Now your task, in addition to being very prepared, as I know you will be, is this. To perform at the Martin Luther King uh, prayer breakfast, you must make, uh, Stephen, you must make all A's in your classes this semester. I, I kid, of course, on that point, but we are so proud of you. And it will be a pleasure to be with you then, uh, as we are pleased to be with you tonight and to hear you, and then we'll look forward to a great presentation by our guest. Ladies and gentlemen, the Mars Hill Gospel Choir.
thank you. How wonderful. No wonder you got chosen for that wonderful honor. And I'm glad you got to hear it tonight with us, that you're going to be doing it. Welcome to the Fall 2017 Presidential Lecture and Performance Series program. I'm Les Raker, the director of the Rural Heritage Museum, and very proud to be a co-sponsor of this event with Dr. Lunsford. And I would briefly like to thank other members of the committee who worked to bring this about, Dr. Joy Kish, Dr. Meredith Doster, Alicia Hackett, uh, Dr. Becky Cody, Samantha Fender, and her staff. In 2016, a $540 million was raised from public and private funds to construct the last building to be placed on the National Mall in Washington, D.C. It included over 400,000 square feet of space and was to house more than 35,000 objects collected from all over the world. This was the Smithsonian Museum of African American History and Culture. And what a time it was to open this museum at the end of the tenure of President Barack Obama and during a period where founding director Lonnie Bunch declared there is a need for clarity and understanding around the issues of race. <clears throat> Indeed, there is still very much needed uh, that clarity. Uh, from 1915, when a group of African American veterans from the Civil War proposed a museum and memorial in Washington to 1929 when Calvin Coolidge actually signed enabling legislation for a memorial celebrating, quote, the Negro's contributions to achievements in America, to ideas proposed in the 1960s and 70s, which found little support from members of Congress. But the desire to create a museum was resurrected in the 1980s with a bill introduced by Representative John Lewis of Georgia, spurring the Smithsonian to launch a formal study about what an African-American presence on the mall might be. And that study concluded that the presence should be a separate museum but budget concerns curtailed uh, the initiative. At that time, the Smithsonian was suffering from an infrastructure deficit across its entire complex, most notably the historic crumbling Arts and Industries building, which is located right next to the castle. In 2003, a commission was appointed by President George W. Bush, studied the question, and again, again and issued a report whose title reflected its verdict, the time has come. Um, Congress then passed a law authorizing the museum that year. It was to be built on the mall at 14th Street and Constitution Avenue Northwest, next to the Washington Monument and within the shadow of the White House. Museums that specialize in an ethnic group identity usually focus on an insider's perspective of that group, but as Director Bunch has said, the story of this museum tells a story that's bigger than that. It embraces not only African-American history and culture, but how that history has shaped America's identity. It was our guest speaker this evening, architect Zena Howard, who was, as a senior project leader from what is now the, the global firm of Perkins and Will, was tasked to blend the cultural expression of African-American story with the built environment in this incredible new museum. Uh, for over 20 years, Ms. Howard has worked as an architect, project leader, and with a career focused on private and public institutions, museums, cultural facilities, libraries, and institutions of higher learning. More specifically, her experience includes diverse buildings and, and clients with specialized or unique design goals, and she'll speak about that, such as environmentally sensitive artifact exhibit areas, historically and culturally, significant buildings and locations, and sustainable design in pursuit of a LEED certification um, and other high performance goals. Zena is a native of North Carolina, graduated from, with a degree in architecture from the University of Virginia, which the, our, one of our greatest architects happened to have built that school, so good choice. Um, and she worked in Richmond, Virginia, and, and, uh, uh, Richmond and uh, Virginia and Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, before coming back to North Carolina in, in 2003. 
Uh, she serves on the North Carolina State University School of Architecture Advisory Board and the University of Virginia Alumni Association Board of Managers. She has lectured at multiple institutions, including MIT, Howard University, Mississippi State University, Louisiana Tech, Tuskegee University, and now Mars Hill University. Uh, she was recently the keynote speaker at the Southeast Museum's conference annual meeting. Ms. Howard is a lead accredited design professional and a member of the American Institute of Architects, the National Organization of Minority Architects, and the National Council of Architectural Registration Boards. This evening, speaking about the Nation Smithsonian National Museum of African American History and Culture and Beyond, Cultural Expression in the Built Environment, it is my distinct honor to present to you Zena Howard. It's uh, quite a pleasure to be with you guys today, and thank you, Les, and thank you, um, Dr. Lunsford. It was a wonderful uh, greeting that you gave. And I want to thank you guys. Um, what Les did not say in my bio is that I'm a PK. All right. <laughs> All right, we got some PKs in the house, and for those of you who look a little perplexed, that is a, a preacher's kid. So, um, so y'all took me back to church, so I appreciate that. That, that was fantastic, so thanks. I've, I've uh, had a wonderful day on um, this uh, tremendous university today, um, meeting with uh, lots of the, of the young people, and you guys inspire me. Um, so thank you for, uh, for that um, selection. Um, so I want to talk about, share some insights with you guys today, starting with uh, the National Museum of African American History and Culture. And believe it or not, um, in two days, it'll be a, one year to the day. Uh, this is September 24th that this museum opened on, on the mall last year um, to much um, you know, acclaim and, uh, and visitation that uh, we have not yet seen and Smithsonian had never seen in the first year of opening a museum. So I'm going to talk about that. Um, be, be, you know, that's the core of my presentation, but um, towards the end I want to, to tell you where um, cultural expression is going from the lens, um, the springboard of the African American Museum. So from the lens of, of African American expression. Okay, I'm going to pull the microphone just a little closer. Is that better? Ah, great, okay. Now I just have to do a balancing act. See the microphone and see my screen. I think I can do it. Um, and I'll, I'll talk up a little louder. Okay, so um, I'm, this museum was 100 years in the making, as, as um, Mr. Riker has indicated. And so, you know, some of the, some of the uh, dates that you see here, starting from 1916, going up uh, when the original African American Civil War veterans marched in Washington. Um, up through 2001, we talked about John Lewis picking up the mantle there. Up through 2003, we heard about um, President George W. Bush finally enacting uh, legislation to create um, a museum dedicated to the legacy of African Americans. And we heard um, uh, discussions ensuing from that point as to what this would be. So I'm going to start in October. Um, 2004 that you see here on the end, Smithsonian did finally appoint a board of regents of 19 key individuals, and uh, most of you recognize those individuals. Uh, Ken Chenault of American Express, CEO, Oprah Winfrey, everybody knows her, I don't think I need to explain, Linda Johnson Rice of Johnson Publishing. So there were some pretty prominent individuals on this, on this board that had to make some key decisions. Um, uh, Mr. Raker talked about Lonnie Bunch being named founding director in 2005. That was also critical. He came with the vision. Keep in mind, when he came um, on board as the executive director of this museum, he had a history previously with the Smithsonian, um, but he was working in Chicago at the time. But there was absolutely no exhibits and no money. <laughs> so uh, there, there, was a, there was a commitment um, by the, the US government to fund this museum up to 50% 50, 50 
So they would fund half and the remaining half would have to be raised by private funds. This is the only Smithsonian Museum that was not 100% funded by the government. Every single one was 100% was funded. This one was only half and, and private funds were raised. So critical towards the end in January 2006, Smithsonian selected a site for the, for the museum and I'm gonna talk about that site a little bit more in a minute. In November 2007, um, Freelon Bond was hired. So that was, that was my firm, the Freelon Group, uh, led by Phil Freelon at the time, in conjunction with um, a firm called um, Davis Brody Bond out of New York. Now Phil Freelon and, and, and Max Bond at that time were the, the two um, preeminent uh, African-American architects in the, in the country. Um, and as a, as a matter of fact, when I joined the Freelon Group, uh, to build the cultural practice with Phil Freelon. That was one of the reasons why I joined. Um, so we were hired in 2007 to do, to do a programming document and we did complete that 2000, or in, um, sorry, two years later. It was a 1,200 page document. Um, finally, in, um, after that point, um, we had to compete to win, win this commission to build, uh, to design this museum. So Smithsonian said, we're going to embark on an international design competition. Um, that, was, uh, that was new to us. We compete all the time for commissions as architects, but internationally means we were, everyone, uh, top design firms in the world competed for this. Um, in 2009, we actually were selected and we won that design competition with our entry, so we were proud about that. In 2012, groundbreaking occurred, and then we began construction. So that's kind of the overall timeline. So I'm gonna back up now, um, and, and this is a little diagram of the 1,200-page of the document that we completed. And um, just to, I put this slide in here just as a reminder that when, back in 2007, we projected that um, this museum would be one of America's most popular museums. We also projected the um, annual attendance um, based on deba demand would be almost close to three million people. And that is, uh, would be one of the heaviest attendant museums in the nation. Um, it's like second to national, or right up there with um, the National Museum of Natural History. So I'm gonna talk about the site. There the site lies, as you see, the red, um, the red dot. So <clears throat> when we started, we were, we were given the site, again, to reiterate, this was the last buildable site on the National Mall. Um, as you can see, it's in the shadow of the Washington Monument. It's um, southeast of the White House. Um, it's directly south of the, um, the Federal Triangle, which are the red copper top uh, clay tile buildings that you see to the north. Um, and, it, and it's an anchor, uh, sort of an end point to our, to our National Mall here. When you look at the site plan, when we looked at this, we said, okay, we have the regular pattern of buildings to the east of the mall going from the U.S. Capitol headed west. Um, you have the, the sequence of museum that's, museums that sort of parade down the mall. And then, in addition, our site is also um, at a hinge point. It, it's sort of at the terminus at the end of all of these um, buildings, but it also is at the beginning of the sort of rolling bucolic landscape of the Washington Monument grounds. So for us, the question was, what does the expression want to be? Should this building be more like the monument grounds to the east, or should it relate more, I'm sorry, to the National Mall on the east or the monument grounds on the west? So it had a bit of an identity crisis when we started looking at this. One thing that we knew for sure was that we could not overlook in the design the, um, the sort of sacredness of this place and the fact that this location was central to so many of our, um, our precious um, uh, monuments, the White House, uh, the Jefferson Memorial, the Lincoln Memorial, the Washington Memorial, the new Martin Luther King Memorial, and certainly the Capitol. 
So through exploration, we decided that we believed that the site should relate more to the Washington Monument grounds. In other words, it should take a very careful approach to development. It should not be overdeveloped. Um, and it should be uh, enough land of this five acre uh, parcel should, be, should remain so that um, it related more and we, can, we could uh, connect the, the paths leading from the White House ellipse to the Washington Monument grounds through our building. This is sort of a, a section to show how we did that was that we kept 60% of this building below grade. So um, at, the, at the ground line, most of the building that you experience is below grade. And up ab above grade is, um, is uh, what, we, what you'll see later is a singular expression that we call a corona. And I'll talk about that in a minute. You can see from the built photographs that um, one of the things that we thought was important um, in respecting this place that we were developing was alignments. So the building, um, this is an, actually an in-progress construction photo, but it aligns perfectly with its neighbor to the east, with, which is American history. And also it relates um, very strongly in alignment height. It's, it's a low scale building, not a, not a very tall building. We didn't want to dwarf any of the, um, the context around it. You can see from this photograph that um, we were careful to, to make sure that the heights did not exceed the, um, the Commerce Building directly to the north of the, of the site. And finally, this is, this is a great photograph because this underscores the point about leaving the majority, as much of the landscape, um, the area open, that five acre site open. So we push so much of the building below grade so that we can preserve this view back towards the Washington Monument. So that kind of explains in a, in a, in, you know, how we sited the building. Um, you can see from this image here, another thing that we thought was important in respecting the site we were on is the, um, the angle of the corona, which I'll talk about in a minute, which is that, um, that delicate skin that you see. It's actually the exact angle of the capstone of the Washington Monument, about 17 and a half degrees. It was a subtle gesture at the time, but we knew it was a respectful gesture, and um, we knew that ultimately people would, would perceive that, and they actually have from the responses that we've, we've received. So with all that, I just kind of talked to you about, about the site and the importance of it. Um, people always ask me, well, how did you guys come up with the form? You know, what is it about? What is the skin about? So um, this was an early rendering that we did, and as you can see, it's a, it's pretty much a, a sort of inverted um, three-part um, uh, triangulated form um, that we call uh, the corona. And then the, the, the main expression on the porch, on the front is something that we call the porch. So let's talk about the corona. We, when we started the competition, I told you we were selected. Um, and around that time, we were actually notified in December of 2008 that we were selected to compete. Around that same time, um, when we first met in, in mid-2009, um, President Barack Obama had just been inaugurated, um, for his first inauguration as President of the United States. So there were some things that were appealing to us. Um, what, the photo that you see down here in the lower um, left-hand side is a, a photo that's, that, we, that was snapped during that inauguration, so that was fresh at the time. What people do when they, when they celebrate, they have this you know, sort of physical uh, bodily gesture of uplifting hands when they honor or celebrate or if there's something that they even revere. Um, we see the same thing here in, in the slide in the upper left. So we were intrigued by just that, that, that notion of, of what people do. The other thing that was appealing to us is, uh, is light and apertures that you see in the, in the slide here, how um, we can, we're able to um, use light to highlight certain natural daylight to highlight certain forms. 
um, agrarian concepts, the, the, I, the notion of a porch and, um, and what that meant to African Americans, many African Americans in the South. I grew up in the South and, um, and we, we sort of uh, you know, used the porch as really a, a truly a, a, a uh, outdoor living space, a space that really did mitigate between the inside and the outside. So we were intrigued by that. Um, and finally, there was this notion of um, going back, uh, the caryatid. So what is a caryatid? Um, uh, David Age is one of the lead designers on here, and he is of West African descent. And so uh, I should back up to say this, this was a collaboration of four architecture firms. We had 31 other consultants other than architects. Um, but the collaboration of four was, uh, was pretty critical because um, understanding from an international perspective what this museum meant and understanding that, um, that black people in this country were mostly derived from West Africa. That was, that was a place from where the diaspora really, um, the genesis of it all. So this form here is actually a caryatid. It's, it's from West African um, art and architecture. It's actually used in many, in many forms as, as structural columns or just sculpture in itself. And the, the, the hallmark of the caryatid is, is the crowning form of, of the corona or crown um, that's used in West African architecture. So that was intriguing to us. So we took this notion of thinking about, you know, celebration, uplifting of arms, thinking about the caryatid, thinking about agrarian concepts and, and the porch and how that was a real sense of community to us. And um, d uh, this was various sketches uh, that were generated during the process of, of looking at the notion that a crown goes above your head, right? And the crown should hold the, the, the precious content of the museum. And so we thought about lifting content above your head and enshrouding that in, in, in a crown-like form or corona-like form. Um, so after we thought carefully about the form of the museum, we thought about materiality. All right, so what, then what? What does the material become? Remember I talked to you about the importance of us, to us, of natural light and, and the dappling of light and how um, architectural form can, um, can, is a real contributor with, with playing with light and shadow and, and producing just marvelous effects. So for that, you know, where we, where we looked to West Africa for the form of the building, for the materiality, we looked here close to home in, in, in the south of, of um, North America uh, in places like New Orleans and Charleston and Savannah that had these intricate uh, ironworks. You, you go there and you see a lot of the ironwork that was done and a lot of that was done by African American craftsmen that detailed um, uh, grapes and leaves and, and um, the result of the merging of those together. And also these areas, when you see them, they create balconies that produce shade so we looked at that, and um, again, we, we as uh, we're modernist designers, I'm not I'm proud to say, uh, to an extent, in other words, in, in the fact that I believe that buildings should be of their place and of their time, and they should not try to mimic something uh, of the past. So we looked at a way to take this, um, these um, traditional forms and abstract them in, um, in, a, in a modern day expression. And then once we did that, we knew that this building had to be one of the most um, sustainable uh, buildings, high performance buildings of uh, Smithsonian's portfolio of buildings. We also knew that we wanted the facade to be variegated. We didn't want it to be stale. We wanted it to move and, and to look different. So we varied the porosity. So we, we came up with uh, different types of panels and they go from very porous to the most dense. And that also helps us privilege views in and out of the building at certain key areas. So with all this, this, this was one of the early models we did in studio. Um, as architects, we, we model everything um, uh, we build physical models, we model in the computer. So this was uh, one of the early models done. 
That told us a little bit that we were moving in the direction, right direction in terms of form, but it was not um, quite enough. So we, we built a full model and studied uh, artificial light and how that could, uh, could uh, impact the building. Well, that still wasn't enough. So at this time, we did have the, the constructor of the project on board, the construction manager. So we said, hey, how about you guys help us out and build um, a full mock-up out in, a, th this was in York, Pennsylvania, where we built, this is just one tier, um, where we built the full mock-up. We were able to test several things here. We were able to test um, natural lighting, artificial lighting, uh, destructive testings um, with blast, water infiltration, bird control, all types of things um, that we were able to inspect. That's um, me actually looking, th this, this picture is critical. One, I, I give you guys some scale there standing, but the other thing is that it shows how we dealt with lighting this, this building. So you have a building on the mall that's porous, right? How do you light something that's porous? Um, so we, we struggled with that for quite some time and then we came up with this notion of what if we just put a gentle frit pattern on the back of the glass and cast light back on the, on the glass and silhouetted the panels against the lighted um, uh, fritted glass. And so that's why the building sort of um, glows uh, at night when you see it and, um, and we were able to, to light that. So here's a built photograph, the end result. You can see here, um, again, the effect was achieved of daylight coming in. Uh, you can see, and it's all throughout the building, when, when you go there, you can see um, at different times of the day, either natural light or artificial lights or just lights from cars passing by. There's always a wonderful movement of pattern and light through those upper areas of the building. So um, we now needed to talk about um, how you experience the building. Um, so that, that, you know, all this is not um, working consecutively. We're actually thinking about these all at the same time, although I'm presenting it to you in a way that is, um, is uh, consecutive. Um, one other thing I would say about, the, about the, uh, the skin of the building before I move to that is that the, at some times when you look at the building, it appears very brassy um, and, and almost glowy. And sometimes it has, like you see on the bottom here, sort of a dark presence on when it's overcast or um, a, uh, a sun, a day where the sun is not out. So that's intentional. I love looking at the building at different times of the day. It never looks th quite the same. This is actually a photograph taken um, a year ago. It was on opening day, um, snapped with just an iPhone. And so you can see the effect of, um, of the, uh, the variegated facade with the panels that are not quite consistent across. So sometimes you can see where they open up so you can see the escalators moving across the facade. And sometimes you can see where they close down. Um, so it, it really is a nice um, effect there. So I uh, want to talk about um, the porch. <laughs> so <clears throat> I told you that, that we were intrigued by the porch because um, it's the manner in which it was used by African Americans, as I stated previously. The other thing about the porch is that um, it's on the south side of the building on the mall. So the mall is very hot. It, it, if anybody's been there during 4th of July celebration, it's hot and there's really no escape from the heat as you walk up and down the mall. So we thought this is a perfect place to provide um, some respite at the end of the mall. So this porch is actually just a, a clear, you know, from 60 foot span blade that um, is, a, is a straight uh, clear span cantilever um, out uh, towards the south, providing this deep cover over a pool of water. And so for us, what that meant is that we can capture winds from the south, you know, prevailing winds, and those winds blowing over water that's unshadowed can create a bit of a microclimate. And it actually does when you're there in the heat. It's, it's a wonderful escape from the mall. This was an early rendering where we imagined um, this porch clear spanning over. And um, we also looked at water. Water was important to us because for us, um, 
it represents the way in which many um, African Americans came to this country, crossing over water. And we thought, um, and you'll see this as a theme through the building, that the, the story of America and African American, it's not, um, it's not always that there were times of, you know, of struggle and peace. There were various themes throughout the building that existed at the same time, um, such as uh, uh, freedom and, um, and enslavement and peace and war. That's just the story of things. So, so we um, conceived of this water as running water at the top, representing more turbulent times and also still water that can represent times of peace, coexisting at the same time, that was very important. We also saw the porch, and this was a construction photo, um, being detached and standing alone from this, this prominent um, corona form to make a strong statement about, um, about the porch. I mean, me as growing up as an African American, uh, that, was, that was the place that I did everything. I played jacks. I know many of you don't know what jacks are but I play jacks, um, and uh, you know, I got my hair braided then. It was just a fabulous, fantastic place. I, I had to, uh, we had to shuck corn on the porch because my mom wouldn't let us do it in the house. So it was really just um, this place where uh, we met all of our neighbors. This is an actual a built photograph, so you can see that, that running water that I talked about juxtaposed to the still, still water. This is a better photograph where you can see them kind of coexisting at the same time. Um, now I wanna talk a little bit about the experience. So this was huge. You know, it's one thing to, to think about a building, but how do you experience it? How does a visitor, how do you tell this very deep story? So for us, this notion of, um, of, of, of going down and putting history below you the deep history that's really immutable, it doesn't change, it is what it is, right? Putting that below you, and then up above, in that corona form, thinking about community and culture, which is always um, uh, occurring and always being created every minute that we, that we live and breathe, putting that enshrouded in the corona above you was the basic theme. So when you come into the main central um, hall, you have um, literally 15 feet of glass all around you. We wanted to protect those views out to the mall because we imagine that the, the views and the, and, the, and the landscape should sort of roll through the building. You should visually perceive that. And from a structural standpoint, this, act, this building is kind of actually built upside down. It's actually built from the top down because we wanted to preserve those views out. We wanted no columns, so it's actually built with four cores that, that do everything. They clearly uh, carry um, you know, heating and ventilation systems, but they serve as, they also carry these huge girders and that corona is hung like a lampshade from the top. It just gent gently is supported at the ground. So that allows us to keep these clear views out. From that point on, you descend down. This is one of my favorite elements in the building. We spend a lot of time designing this um, monumental stair. But you s descend down to the history gallery. It takes you 400 years. Oh, by the way, this is another view of, the, um, of that central hall and a wonderful piece done by Richard Hunt for those of you, your art majors here. So you descend down and you really drop 400 years in history. So um, when you go, this was an early rendering done of the history gallery. Um, it, 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 it's expanded downward. And so you, you descend down in sort of a customized, it is a custom elevator that drops you to the, to the year 1400 um, and the beginnings of, of the slave period. And you begin to understand the impact. You come out of that and you come to antebellum period, at the same time you're seeing um, the a segregated rail car. And at, at the same time, back here in the distance, you're seeing that's a, a cabin that a freed man built at the same time as you're seeing a cabin that an enslaved family uh, lived in. And so this allowed us to, to continue with that theme of, of things occurring at the same time. Um, everybody asked how we got some of these large artifacts in. Well, they were, they were moved in and 
dropped in. This was the, the train car that was dropped in um, as we um, uh, built the building, and we continued to build the building around it, so it was quite a feat getting that in. These are finished photographs. You can see that, that rail car in place. You're able to walk through it and experience it. You can also see um, we were able to, to a, um, acquire a, a guard tower from the infamous Angola prison uh, that was also moved in at the same time. You, so we, you see these very large artifacts. This is a Tuskegee Airman's plane that, that we hung in there. But at the same time, you know, these grand large moves are great and it's wonderful that um, Smithsonian was able to acquire these artifacts. And I should pause to say when we started this project, Smithsonian had zero artifacts. There was nothing. So as they were acquiring content, we were designing at the same time, so uh, to be able to make sure we told, we told the story. They also were able to acquire these very intimate artifacts. Here, that what you see to the left are um, the ballast from a slave ship. So um, that uh, slave ships were, you, you know when, you had a, when a, a slave ship was authentic because they ballast the bottom of it because human cargo is much lighter than material cargo. So that was what they were able to acquire there. These are the slave, um, the, the uh, freed papers of a, or the papers of a freed slave. Uh, this was a little um, container. The, the pra papers were so precious to them that they built containers to carry their, their papers in. As you continue moving, you sort of come out of that history. So that's really deep. It's, it's, there's a lot going on there. You'll see when you visit the museum. So you come out of that, that history gallery. You ramp up through time from the, you know, the, the transatlantic slave period, and it sort of ends at, in 1980. We wanted to provide a space coming out of that history um, that you can sort of, um, you know, kind of release. And so this is a contemplative court where we pierced an oculus on the north side of the building. We pierced the landscape, allowing natural light to come in. And then we used, we used water in a very different way. Remember at the beginning, we used it as in a, in a horizontal way. In this way, we used it vertically. So um, when you hear the water and see it in a vertical motion, it's, it's cleansing in a sense. And um, we thought it was appropriate, this quote from um, Dr. Martin Luther King about justice running down like water and righteousness like a mighty stream. So this is a very um, special place for us. All right, so you come out of the history gallery, you're out, you've been cleansed, and then now what, right? Um, we want to move you now up through the corona. Um, so this, this was important to us. Um, so you move up through the building in between the corona skin and the exhibit box. So the exhibit is, is one box, and there's a space around it, and then there's the corona. We thought it was extremely important um, that you remember where you are and you respect the fact that you are at an important place in our nation. And so we didn't want to turn our back on that because museums, by nature, are very immersive experience. You get immersed in the interpretation, immersed in the content, so you can just close in on yourself. We wanted to bring you out of that at key moments to, to uh, remind you where you are. So we punctured the exhibit box here with what we call lenses or they're basically apertures. And you can see here, um, this, is, this is actually the same lens on the inside when you're in the military gallery. And so it brings you out of that and suddenly you're sort of confronted with a, a perfectly um, framed view out of that exhibit box to the Washington Monument. Um, and we did that in several other areas with, with vistas or panoramic views to key um, prominent places in the context. And that's that, um, that view from, the, um, from the, that same lens looking from the west side back towards the east of the building. And you can see also the panoramic view. So moving up, now you're in. This is the corona, right? So you've got galleries up above here. You've got the galleries of community and, and culture. And it gets really fun on these floors. I'll just share with you a, a little bit here. Um, 
oops, let me go back. Uh, you know, you, you come up and, and this is, we actually did acquire a full caryatid. So you actually can see what that looks like, that sculpture there. This is the fun floor of community all about food and, 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 um, and, and culture and things that feed into that. Uh, you have the visual arts contributions there. You have sports, African-American contributions to sports. Film and Black Hollywood. Um, my favorite, this was a, a, a tremendous find when Smithsonian told us they had Chuck Berry's Red Cadillac. <laughs> we, we all went down to the warehouse just to peer upon it and sit in it briefly. Um, so that was amazing. And then uh, some of you know, uh, you know, from my era, the, the mothership is there. That's the mothership, George Clinton, Bootsy Collins. Um, I fundamentally believe people were smaller back then because I couldn't even get into some of these outfits. I don't know how grown men got into them. And so, so the end of this is, is uh, of this um, museum is that this was, this is my team here. Um, and that's Phil Freelon, that's myself. We photoshopped ourselves into this. Clearly this was an, not an achievable um, photograph. But what it says is that um, this is a huge building. It's 400,000 square feet. The amount of exhibits is, is over 100,000. That's two times the, the, um, the square footage of the White House. Um, we delivered um, seven volumes of, of drawings, nearly 2,000 sheets of drawings, almost 6,000 pages of specifications um, on site. I was on this project eight years full time. We had uh, 28 total people on site, um, 33 design firms, so uh, that I was leading 33 design firms, four architectural firms, and, and we actually had two structural engineers that were fantastic to work with. Um, construction facts, 72,000 cubic yards of concrete, and um, one concrete truck is 10 cubic yards, so that kind of puts it in perspective for you. Um, there was a lot of concrete uh, on the site. We had um, 36,000, I'm sorry, 3,600 um, cast aluminum panels that were used for the corona. And uh, we had three, our construction entity was a joint venture of three um, construction firms. Uh, and uh, so, so it was sort of um, kind of a, a, a lot to manage there, but a fantastic endeavor. Um, so if I have time now, I would like to, um, to tell you, because people always ask me, so what's next? After you do a half a billion dollar <laughs> museum on the National Mall, which you don't get one, uh, many of the, if any, in your career ever, what, what's next? So um, this project, it was, it was already, we were already trending in a way relative to African American culture of expressing culture in a different way. Um, so I'm gonna share with you snippets of, of kind of on the board's work to give you a highlight of where we believe we're taking culture um, first in a sense um, uh, of, of, a, of a fantastic project that's going on now, but also beyond the bounds of traditional, the built form, the, the walls of, of, of traditional architecture. So what's next? The Motown experience. So, <laughs> yay. So uh, we, we started working with Motown and I was, I was talking to Ms. Raker just before the, the, um, the, the lecture. Um, you have to have, you know, you have to have a passion for doing cultural work. You know, all of these, we, you know, it was 10 years working on the National African American Museum. And when you start with these clients, oftentimes they have deep vision and passion, which we love, but no resources. So you have to, you have to work with them to develop content and resources. So we've been working with them. Um, Motown, two and a half years. We start construction um, in about uh, early part of uh, January in about three months. And um, this was a, a fantastic uh, story. Uh, Motown really is uh, the music that changed America. And I always look at this as, as four ingredients. Um, some people like to start with Barry Gordy, the founder of Motown, but I like to start with his family because uh, none of us are who we are today in a bubble. Um, and his family had strong um, 
structure and vision. So Barry Gordy was a man with a vision. Um, and he was at that time working on, for one of the big three car manufacturers in Detroit on the assembly line, hearing the regular beats of the, of the equipment on the assembly line, hearing that he began to develop beats and rhythms in his head to that, and to that regular um, mechanical rhythm. And he thought to himself, I think I can create music. Now, keep in mind, at the time, um, there was no way that African-American music and popular music were mixing. So there was no way for African-Americans to even publish a record or express. So for the most part, um, there were young kids in Detroit making music on the streets, and he knew these kids were talented. So he had a vision, but there were other two things that was two parts of the recipe. The other recipe is that he was in a city at that time that provided tremendous opportunity. So during that time, there was a great migration of people from to Detroit because um, there was so much opportunity being provided, particularly for African Americans. So he, there was a city that was a third part of the recipe. There was a city of opportunity. The fourth part was that he decided that um, he needed a place to make this music. So he purchased a little house um, called Hitsville. He named it Hitsville because he, he had a vision that he could make hits. And uh, he purchased that house because it was the only house in that area that had a detached garage that he can actually make these hits. Um, I'll, I'll go back one second. Uh, so what he did was he plucked people off the streets. He plucked people called uh, little young Diana Ross, a Smokey Robinson, a Marvin Gaye. He just drove around and said, you, you, you. And he believed that he could, he could um, put them through almost like a, a manufacturing process. They can come through the door of Hitsville as these young kids, you know, younger than you guys, much younger. They were 17 uh, and on average, and come out the other end stars. So he thought he can manufacture stars, and he was correct. So they recorded all the music, every last single one of those Motown music that you guys think um, Usher is creating, no, <laughs> you know, and all of these, um, you know, P. Diddy or who other, all these other folks are derived from, from Motown. So um, how he was able to do it was there's, there's a clear sound. Everybody recognizes that, that reverberation, that clear reverb of a Motown hit. What he did was he, he recorded in that studio, and this house had an A-frame, you know, an attic frame. All he did was simply pipe um, with, with rudimentary uh, uh, materials and processes, just pipe, record it in the studio and pipe the sound up through the A-frame and recorded the reverb off the, once it uh, reverberated from the A-frame. So ma the majority studios could not, um, they tried to, to recreate the Motown sound. They kept in their own sophisticated studios, they had all the money, couldn't do it. They didn't know it was just the result of the actual house itself. <laughs> so that was creating the sound, so that was amazing. So. We got this project, so how, how did we, how are we approaching this? Um, it comes from thinking about, we looked at one man, Marvin Gaye, really, and, and the legendary hit that he created, What's Going On? And so we said, how far can we trace what's going on? So this is what you see, this is the actual audio um, uh, track of what's going on. Uh, we took that pattern and associated with all of the um, record albums or CDs that people stack up on a shelf. And we did an expression of the building. And it wasn't just enough just to express the building. Um, you know, we had to be sensitive to, to Hisville House. It wasn't just enough just to express this building. We knew the building needed to have a, a, a subbeat motion and rhythm. So the pattern behind the sub-rhythm that you see the music is the pattern of, of what's going on. And what that song meant at the time, anybody that knows their music history, it was revolutionary. It was a rebel song at the, t at the time. But you know Marvin Gaye went out on a limb to sing about something 
um, a war, <laughs> all these things that were happening um, that he expressed in music. We wrapped these, um, this album, Sensibility, all the way through the building and create open courtyards and gingerly respect the, um, the uh, existing structures of the Motown campus. So that was one. Um, now, um, do I have a little bit more time? Okay, I'd like to share with you now how we, we started that practice and that's dealing with specific buildings or campuses. Um, where we're taking the practice now is, um, is out on a macro scale, more to the urban um, design and, and in the heart of these cities. So what's going on now is that um, Back in the, larger than the mid 60s, early 70s, we all know when cars were big, you know, I just started talking about Detroit and it got so famous and the big three so popular because cars in 1950, before 19, you know, starting really in 1950 was the response, was so uh, prevalent. So cities began to building roads and infrastructure largely to support motor vehicles. What happened as a result of that is that they had to figure out um, paths to, to, to route these highways through. And largely, um, what was done in most urban cities, many urban cities um, in, in North America, was that the paths that were chosen were um, through neighborhoods and vibrant communities that had the least um, socio-political capital or agenda or um, people that really uh, didn't have a voice and could not speak up for themselves. So oftentimes, vibrant neighborhoods and the potential of those neighborhoods was destroyed. So now here we are 50, 60 or more years later, well these, um, the infrastructure is dilapidated, it needs to come down. So we're experiencing a time right now where we can actually um, honor and remember and restore some dignity back to some of these people who um, were instantly uh, without a home. So um, Sycamore Hill is in Greenville, North Carolina. And I'll quickly go, go through this. Um, everybody knows this is a picture of historic Greenville. Uh, if you look here, this is sort of the Sycamore Hill community from a historic perspective right, right in here. This here was, uh, you see uh, images of, the, it was a, it was a, a very um, prominent African American community and the stalwart of their community was this church that sat on the corner. And um, they pretty much, that was the thing, the, the, the edifice and the, and the, um, the uh, community or the infrastructure in the community that provided structure for kids and education and opportunity. Um, most of the people that went to this church, the kids went on um, to be like educators, doctors, and prominent um, people. So it was a vibrant community. So what happened under the, under the guise of urban renewal? Uh, the neighborhood was, was wiped out. The community did fight to keep the church. Um, and, and literally the houses were just raised, were just destroyed. Um, and people were told to move. They did fight to keep the church, and you can see here where even the road was routed around the church as a result of, of efforts to keep it. But um, unfortunately, uh, the church fell to arson because uh, you know there were people that just um, you know were did not want that church to remain. And so, what is our call now? Um, our call now. Uh, the city is now coming in and, and doing a, a huge master plan um, of, of this entire area that was once uh, uh, the Sycamore Hill community. But this corner here um, is important to commemorate and honor what was lost and return something back to the people that lost it. So we see this as a tremendous opportunity. There were three themes in engaging with this community. And our work is not work without community engagement, without understanding um, what needs to, how can I express something in built form when I don't know what needs to be expressed. So community and pride was a strong theme. Spirituality, evidently the music and the structure, what you heard today, there were people 
that attended that church and did not attend that church that would talk about how when you walk by there on a Sunday, you just heard the music emanating from the church and it was a beautiful music. And history and prominence was important to, to the, this community and in restoration of, of this um, area. So we came up with this theme about music, right? And how, because music was so important and how, um, how music in, innately is, is a framework that allows for creativity, but it is based on a framework. So we looked at the notions of, of the, the regular structure of music and this notion that there were 22 founders of the church that, um, that should be recognized somehow. And we looked at, at um, uh, nature and gathering, things that the, that the church reception, um, spaces that the church celebrated. And we also dug up an old plan of the church. And we noticed that there were, there were certain prominent areas where there was glass um, and we thought that that was critical to express these areas of sanctuary, um, celebration, gathering. So um, we extracted that in, in sort of what we're calling an outdoor memorial or outdoor museum. And um, the result is what we're looking at, uh, an outdoor expression, um, pulling in stained glass at the key areas where where there was stained glass and these 22 elements really reflecting where um, fundamental uh, areas of where the church um, was. The prominence on the corner being something vertical that is reminiscent of the tower without trying to replicate it, but you get a sense of the spirituality you know, back to some extent. Um, interpretation woven throughout that can help um, tell the story and celebrate um, the, the history of, of this place, uh, areas of reflection as you move across. So that was uh, briefly Sycamore Hill. Um, and I'll share with you, okay, three minutes, I'll share with you briefly Vancouver where we've done the same thing um, here, similar. And I, I should say that Vancouver was a place that, um, if anybody's ever been, wonderful place, by the way, fantastic. But their claim to fame all of these years was that um, they, would, in, in one essence, kind of snubbed their nose up at the states because they, were, they said, well, we're one of the major cities who actually did um, urban renewal right. We never ran a major viaduct through our city. You know, we didn't do like these you American cities um, that worship your cars, but they did. They actually did. Um, it was a little um, community called Hogan's Alley, and that community was wiped out um, by a viaduct, and it was a small African American community that existed, um, as you see there. Um, vibrant, these are some of the urban fabric and uses. Um, there were some areas of that community that was dilapidated, yes, but there were some areas of that community that was thriving and, um, and prominent. And so the, the, the message there was um, we are now working in Vancouver to restore this entire 11-acre um, block back to the, the residents of Vancouver um, in a way that is... Um, respectful. And I'll say one last comment without going through it. Charlotte Brooklyn Village would be the last project. Most of you know, 17-acre um, redevelopment. This is actually going to be one of the largest re urban redevelopments of a major city ongoing at this time when we started. Um, right there in the second ward, in the heart of Brooklyn Village, a, another prominent neighborhood that was um, uh, uh, destroyed through urban renewal. And this one is critical because this really was the place in North Carolina, the only place where blacks had, they actually had their own high school, Second Ward High School, um, and they, they saw education as a way out of, um, you know, being disenfranchised and, and a step towards freedom. So um, I'll end it there. And uh, that gives you kind of a glimpse of the macro scale where we're taking some of the, the cultural expression and restoration, particularly as it relates to, um, to coming off the heels of the National Museum of African American History and Culture. Thank you.
It is a tradition when we bring an esteemed guest to our campus uh, for a presidential lecture or performance that we um, present them with a memento of their time with us. So, Ms. Howard, we ask you to come forward so that we may present you uh, with some items and I will at least uh, do part of this. Uh, this includes a uh, certificate of appreciation uh, uh, here to the university um, and we're delighted that you have been here and we appreciate uh, your time and your expertise and your willingness to share it with us. And there are a few other things in here as well. So thank you very, very thank much. You. Thank you. Uh, we will conclude our evening uh, by again thanking all of you, uh, faculty, staff, students, and again the, the Mars Hill Gospel Choir. Uh, again, so much we appreciate you. And if you uh, wish to hang around a few moments, we would uh, possibly you could speak to Ms. Howard uh, one on one. Uh, we won't keep her terribly late uh, because she has uh, a portion of her time with us will be tomorrow. Uh, so, again, thank you very much. Uh, we'll look forward to seeing you on another occasion for a presidential lecture performance here at Marcia University. Good night.